congratulations, you've made it to the next video. Um, so now we've moved on from the basics of Python operators, variables, and functions. And we're going to move on to two new topics. And since it takes a little while, I think we're going to split this into a part A and B. Uh, so that'll be on conditionals and then on lists in Python. Both of these are really useful for solving more realistic engineering problems. Um, here I've got a picture of a towing tank. So a towing tank like this, often used for things like we're showing here where we're pulling some engineering object through the water, and then we measure things like the drag, the resistance to that towing. Um, but another feature of this particular towing tank is that we can use it to send waves down. So we can add waves to this tank. And we do that by having a paddle on the end and oscillating that paddle back and forth with some frequency. Um, and so we're going to use this as an engineering example to motivate the use of conditionals and lists. Okay, so let's get started. Before we get to the application, let's talk about it a little bit more in terms of basics. So there are two states for a Boolean variable, right? It can only be true or false, not like an integer or a float or something like that. Um, and as soon as we have true and false defined, then we can use all of the standard kind of logical statements that you're used to from Boolean logic. You've got not and, and you've also got or. So as your first little assignment, why don't you try to look through this list what do you think the result is going to be from these different So first is that the type of this A variable is a bool. So that's the type, just like we had ints and strings and floats, now we also have bool objects. Um, then, of course, when we say not something, we mean we're flipping from true to false or false to true. So since A was true, now not A is false. A and B, that means that both things have to be true to return true, and that is the case for A and B, but it's not the case for A and C. A or C, or means that if either is true, you return true, so that's the case. And then this last one, whenever you're dealing with logical statements, just like arithmetic, you should go inside the parentheses first, right? So C or B, then B is true, so that means this part is true. Not A, that was false, but this is true, so the or should return true, and it does. Okay, so hopefully that's all pretty straightforward um, Boolean logic. But we are not doing logic here, we're not philosophers. <laughs> so much more common is that we'll be using some kind of operation to test conditionals on two numbers, right? So here's the operations that we've got to test the relationship between two numbers. First, we have a double equal sign. So a single equal sign in Python is assignment. That means we're assigning this variable a certain value. The double equal sign is a test for equality. So does A equal B? And that's a true false answer that comes out. Similarly, the opposite is not equal to. So in this case, the exclamation part bang equals a not equal B, is that true or false? Less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, okay? So shouldn't be anything too confusing in there. So again, let's go through and do some examples. So read through this list and try to, in your head, figure out what the computer is going to do, what Python is going to do, and then test yourself by hitting play, okay? You can pause the video. All right, now let's talk through it. So five equals five, of course, that's true. But this next one's a little more interesting because on the left, we have a float five, and on the right, we have an integer five. So are those the same? Yes, they are. And so asking if they're not equal returns a false. So that's good, of course, because otherwise we'd have to worry about converting integers to floats or vice versa before we made a comparison, and luckily Python will do that for you. But no such luck here. The kind of word five does not equal the number five. Those are two different things. So those do not equal, okay? And then of course we can do any kind of arithmetic we want and then check equality. So 10 divided by two is five. 25 to the one half power is five because one half power is a square root. 
So this is equal, so again, we get a false. Four is greater than or equal to four. Yes, it's equal to, so that's true. Four plus a very small number is greater than four. Yes, of course, true. Four plus one divided by a very small number. That seems like it should be greater than, but no, careful of parentheses, of course. This is five divided by a very small number, not four plus one divided by a very small number. So again, check your parentheses. Um, so that one comes out as false. And then of course we can add these conditions together with and or not. And so in this case, this one's not true, but the other one is, and so the result is true. Okay, so far so good, we're just warming up. Let's do another kind of warm up exercise where we're now going to put a conditional, or we're going to put one of these Boolean tests into a function. So the classic example from computer science is to do an is odd function. So we'll just test whether a number is odd or not. How do we write that out mathematically the simplest way possible? There are some ridiculous ways to do it. The simple way is to just take the modulus operator, right? Because when we divide by two, we'll either have a remainder of one or zero if the input is an integer. And so we'll only get is odd true when we put in something that's odd at that point, when we have a remainder of one. Oops. So let's do that and we'll run this code and check. All right, so we've run the code over this range of values. We understand how ranges and loops work now. Something new is that we've got a print statement that looks different than before. Instead of just printing is odd i to figure out if it says false true, false true, we've put this additional string in here. And the way you can read this is kind of as a Mad Lib or a placeholder, right? The number blank is odd, and then there's another blank. And this format function then takes these two numbers I've got in here as arguments, and it sticks them inside the string. So the number zero is odd, that's false. The number one is odd, that's true. So we go through and we can fill in this truth table uh, that way. So this format statement, it's just cosmetic, it's just to keep things pretty, uh, but it is a useful uh, statement to know how to format things nicely the way you want. It's also an example of a function that looks a little bit different. So this is called a method. And we did talk about that a little bit in the first one, but let's go over it again. So this string, remember this is just like a variable like we had before, but now we see that we put a dot afterward and then we have this function which is attached to the string. That's called a method when you have things that are tied on. So that's the sort of thing that we're gonna see more and more of as we start importing libraries. So it's good to get this kind of idea. So instead of saying format and then passing it the string as an argument, we have the string and then dot format. Okay, we need one more tool before we get onto the engineering example, and that's conditional statements. So that's if then kind of statements. So in a function, you can write down something where we say if and then some Boolean test. So this will return true, false. And if it's true, it'll do whatever's following. And we notice we've got another indentation block. So that's how Python decides what to do here. If this conditional is false, then it'll go to the next line without executing this line. That's how it works. The next line here is L if. So that's a condensed form of else if. So now we test another conditional. And you can keep doing that as long as you want. Uh, so here, if this one is not true, then we'll check the next one, else if in greater than zero in this case. And if that one's true, you'll do this print statement. And then the last one here we've got is else, and that's a catch-all. So if none of the ones above are true, it will always at least do this one. Um, so you'll do one and only one of these three print statements given any value of n. That's the goal. Okay, so we've done this with this new function, describe number. We pass in the number in, and then we check if it's odd. We check if it's greater than zero, and depending on those properties, we'll do one of these three print statements. Let's check. 
So negative two is even and not greater than zero. That's certainly true. So we can see that it's failed this first one. It's failed the second one. And so it's done the else. Then minus one is odd because it is. And so it's done this uh, print statement. And zero is even and not greater than zero. That's correct. It's not greater than zero. It's equal than zero. One is odd. Two is even and greater than zero. OK, so it's all worked. This kind of way of picking different paths for the program to go is called branching. And it's really useful. And we're going to see that in our next example. OK, so let's get to that now. So one of the main things we want to be able to predict when we're doing these waves that go along the tank is what are the length of these waves? So the crest to crest length between these, and that's got the Greek letter lambda, so that's L in Greek. And we can predict this length as a function of this frequency in certain cases. So there's a more complicated formula that lets you always solve for this. But in the simplified case, we can say that this is equal to 2 pi g, where g is the acceleration of gravity, right? So this is g downward, divided by omega squared. So this is our formula, but this isn't always true. It's only true in certain cases. So no matter how deep the ocean or the wave tank, there'll always be a bottom at some point. And the depth between that bottom and the kind of mean wave height, we're going to call that h, the depth of the tank. And this formula is only true when lambda is less than 2h. Okay, So in that case, the wave is short enough that we can consider this a deep water wave, and we can use this deep water relationship. If, on the other hand, the wave is much too long, we have a shallow water wave, then this equation isn't valid and we can't use it. So this is a perfect example for this conditional branching. All right, so let's try it out. So we first define this simple function for the deep water wavelength. We can see that I've only passed in omega here, and that's because the other two things in the formula, pi and g, are both constant. I guess I could have added g in in case you wanted to think about waves on other planets. But on Earth, we're pretty good with 9.81 meters per second squared. So we'll stick with that. And then we just do the algebra and output it that length in meters. OK, so far so good. But we know that that's not always valid. So we write a second function called check wavelength. And in this case, omega is one of the inputs, and the other input is h. So we can see that kind of only looking at the deep water relationship, we don't need to know h. But as soon as we think about the whole relationship, we need to know both omega and h to test if this is correct. So first, we just call the function. So this is an example of one function calling another. Only need to pass it omega. So far, so good. This is kind of our candidate wavelength. And then we check it. And we check it exactly the way it's written above if L less than 2 times H. If that's true, then we'll print out the wavelength and the frequency that we gave it as an input. If it's not true, however, we'll say, can't do it. Wave is not deep water. OK, and we'll do this for a range of values. So here I'm switching from 2 up to 8 in increments of 1. All right, and we can see the results. So wave is not deep water when H equals 3 meters and omega is 2 radians per second. Also not for omega is 3 radians per second. But as we increase omega 4, 5, 6, 7, then I'm able to use this deep water relationship. And so I get wavelengths of 3.85 and so on down to 1.26 meters. All right, two important things to look at in this example. First new thing we haven't seen before is that h equals 3 is given as this argument. So what this is doing is it's setting a default value for this variable. So I don't need to give it an argument here. If I don't give it any, which I haven't, then it'll default to 3. 
why have I done that? Because that's how deep our towing tank is. So it's a good default value. But of course, I have a friend who works at Solent and he has a tank that's one meter deep. And I can put in this value and run the test again. And now we can see that for this more shallow tank, we need to be more worried about shallow water effects. The deep water wave is only valid for these more high frequency cases with omega six or seven. Now these other two, which before were fine in a deeper tank, now we can't use this deep water relationship because our tank's not as deep anymore. Okay, so this is a really nice thing, this optional argument feature. And again, you just get that by giving a default value. And then Python says, don't worry if I don't know, if this isn't given, then it'll run. Of course, if I try to not give omega, I'll just get an error because I haven't given a default value for omega and it doesn't really make sense to do so. We've seen optional arguments before. For instance, in range, we don't need to give the value of two. Uh, we do in this case, because a value of zero as a frequency doesn't make sense. But this is an example of an optional argument that we've used before, but we hadn't written one before. So now we have. The second thing that's new in this example is that here in this print statement, I haven't just said blank like I did before. Now I've given this weird notation. <laughs> so I've got a colon and then dot 3G. So this is kind of a holdover from old computer code stuff. It's the way I want this real number to be formatted. So I'm saying I want three to be the number of significant digits. So that's why this is being printed out in three significant digits. Why have I done that? Well, because if I don't do that, then the result is kind of a mess. And I have this false sense of high precision. But Remember, I only used g equals 9.81. So I'm only starting with three significant digits. It makes a lot more sense to keep three significant digits in my output so that I don't give anybody a false sense of security from my program, okay? So that's a handy little thing as well. So this is a format statement. If you're interested in format statements, you can go back up to the link that I had above, all right? I think that's it for this, yeah. Okay, so a nice short one just on Booleans and conditionals. And then in the next one, we'll talk about lists.